You know you should use artificial intelligence on your L&D team, but how do you get started? I think of the AI as another human in the room. If I need someone to bounce ideas off of, if I need someone to discuss with, if I need someone to say, hey, this is what I've put together, help me identify X, Y, Z. I use the AI as if it was another all-knowing person. That's Janessa Jacobs, Director of Training at Second Avenue. She'll offer practical ways that you can use AI in your everyday work to make you and your team more efficient and productive. Next on Powered by Learning. Powered by Learning is brought to you by DaVinci Interactive. DaVinci's approach to learning is grounded in 30 years of innovation and expertise. We use proven strategies and leading technology to develop solutions that empower learners to improve quality and boost performance. Learn more at DaVinci.com. Joining me today is DaVinci Client Solutions Consultant Angeline Evans and our guest, Janessa Jacobs, Director of Training at Second Avenue. Great to see you again, Janessa. Hi, Janessa. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for having me today. Well, we're so glad you could join us. Let, let's start off by telling our listeners a little bit about your background and also your role at Second Avenue. Absolutely. So I am a certified professional in training management. Um, I currently work as the director of training at Second Avenue, which is a single family real estate property management company. And what I'm doing here is I am standing up their learning and development department. Prior to that, I did the same thing for Pinnacle Home Care. I've worked for Coca-Cola and a few other health uh, and home health companies. Well, that's great. Well, we're excited to learn more about your journey uh, in your current role and also uh, how you're using artificial intelligence. We can all learn from each other there. Yes, absolutely. So you have a book coming out, How to Apply AI to Your Addy Model. Can you tell us more about that? For sure. So the book is scheduled to come out this December. I'm very excited for it. And what it does is it takes the very popular Addy Model and it applies AI to it. And one of the things that you'll hear me say if you've uh, listened to me on a webinar discussing AI is save your brain power. Save your brain power for the important things and let AI do the heavy lifting. It goes over a lot of things through the Addy model, like how do you apply AI to analysis? How do you apply it to design, development? How can you apply it even to the end of the process uh, with your evaluations and turning around that ROI very quickly? That is so cool. I'm really excited to read it when it comes out in December. Yeah, we'll, we'll, um, we'll put it in the show notes too so people yeah. can find it easily. You know, I'm really interested if we could dive deeper into each component of the Addy model. Um, I, I love your note about how it helps you save brain power because that's so true. Sometimes you just get stuck in a creative rut with a sentence or something or really hung up on one piece and it slows you down along the process. So could you share like a case study example or anything that could help us walk through and, and envision this? For sure. For sure. So I use this in my process often. And I know that Addy is not a model that is commonly used just because SAM is much quicker and there's even agile methods that allow for more flexibility, especially as quick as everything changes. So what the book's designed to do is talk about if you are doing any portion of the Addy model that falls under either SAM or Agile methods, you can still apply AI to it. So for example, in my business, we work more in a SAM model, more of a successive you know, approximation. Um, and then we decompress and we move from there. Um, when we do that process of that decompressing, that re-clarifying, that getting approximately close to it, and then the process we call cleaning it, we utilize AI a lot for the analysis of that. So that's things like identifying gaps, looking at what we call the three Ps, the people, the process or the product and identifying where the gaps are within that by throwing it through things like even chat GPT. So when I put my analysis process into chat GPT, I ask it to do an audience analysis. I ask it to do a context analysis. I ask it to do things like a performance analysis. Um, I ask it to do things like a stakeholder analysis based on a uh, previous things people have done that it can pull from. You know, even a constraint analysis, there may be things and challenges that I didn't think to think of that then I can include in a project plan to get closer to our finished product. 
Additionally, too, in our surveys, it's such a huge help with our surveys because I don't have to think about questions to ask. I can also then ask the AI to generate my questions in a language in which my audience can understand. So I'm making sure to uh, get a little bit more input, if you will, through that. Um, I can also ask it to even test my surveys for me or test my project scope and look for holes and gaps and things that I may not have thought of. So that's one of the ways that I apply it to my analysis. Um, when we talk about the design, it's the same thing. It's helping me to find gaps. It's helping save my brain power coming up with, you know, what's the best way to do this. When I go through my design process, I, I run by the rule of if it's information that does not change, it's basic information. And that basic information for me is usually e-learning. So I design out my process through things like chat GPT saying, hey, design an e-learning for me that consists of this basic information. Obviously, being very mindful of any proprietary information, being very mindful of anything that's sensitive information. I tend to use the training industry actually has a great model in there that's the content, and that helps me determine whether or not it's safe to put it into the AI. Wonderful. So for folks that might be listening that are brand new to chat GPT and AI in general, when you say you're using it in the analysis and the design phase, are you inputting notes? Are you inputting feedback gathered? Can you be more specific about the types of things you're entering to get the results you need from the tools? For sure. I think of the AI as another human in the room. Okay. And what I mean by that is if I need someone to bounce ideas off of, if I need someone to discuss with, if I need someone to say, hey, this is what I've put together, help me identify X, Y, Z, whether that's gaps, whether that's how to design this into a scenario, how to create a script for it, how to uh, give me a well thought out project scope. I use the AI as if it was another all-knowing person in that sense. So I have a discussion with it. And then based on what I put in, whether that be questions, whether that be, hey, read my text and help me summarize, understand, or change the language, I then ask follow-up questions. And I adjust and I, I ask the AI to adjust its process as well so that we get closer to the model and what I'm looking for. So you're saving the brain power that way. I'm saving the brain power. I have two of me being able to do this. <laughs> I do like how you mentioned you ask questions. I do the same thing. I use it as like an independent brainstorming partner as if there is a real person on the other end. I don't know why I'm so conversational with chat GPT. <laughs> I'm sure I'm so <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> um, but it certainly helps. So that's, I mean, that's, that's wonderful the way you're using it. Have you what has your experience been with your colleagues and learners when they see how much you've integrated AI into the process? Obviously, there's a lot of awe and a lot of wonder because AI is so new to us. And there's a lot that we don't understand with AI. There's a lot I don't understand with AI, but I got to tell you, I love using it. But there's a lot of awe. There's a lot of wonder. There's a lot of excitement. And there's a lot of re-engagement that happens back into the training and back into being a part of the process because of this. I bet a lot of, a lot of people are in awe in part because they haven't been able to experiment with it like you have. Do you think a little bit of it is just that, that fear of the unknown, not knowing how to get started? I mean, do you, do you think that that's at all some of the apprehension? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, and this is what a great, uh, what a great topic to bring up because whenever I look at identifying in training, you know, why, why are we training on this? It usually comes down to two things. It's either confidence or competence, you know, so the confidence to be able to do it or the competent to be able to do it. So if they're not confident in utilizing it, they're not going to utilize it. If they're not competent in utilizing it, they may be utilizing it, but they're not doing it correctly in there. I think you're correct in the sense that getting into something that is unknown can be very scary for some, but developing that confidence, developing that competence then is, is a big step in the process. So tell me more about the development, implementation, and evaluation phases. 
Absolutely. So the development phase is one of my absolute favorites when it comes to utilizing AI and utilizing things like ChatGPT. Um, so like I said before, a lot of my basic information usually goes into e-learning because there's not a lot of variables. But once we start getting into that intermediate or advanced level, I usually like to have ChatGPT help me to create things like PowerPoints, help me create role plays, help me create scenarios, help me think of variables that might happen within this process that we could then prepare our learners for. So as we begin to develop those, we can have AI create scripts, we can have AI create variables, we can have AI even be a part of our training process in a conversation practice. And for PowerPoints, are you finding it helpful in creating your screen text or even going as far as to creating some facilitator scripting points? Absolutely both. Yep. Um, a lot of times when I get into that development phase, I'll say, hey, you know, here are my objectives that I need to train on. Please design a PowerPoint that will meet these objectives. And then we go through and refine. Once I get that to the way I like it, I'll then ask the AI, hey, please generate a facilitator script that matches the PowerPoint. Janessa, you mentioned chat GPT, but for people listening who are thinking, well, AI, that sounds great. But that's so broad. Like, can you suggest other tools that you've used to really implement this into your workflow each day? For sure. So there's a lot that is like ChatGPT, such as Google Labs. There's a lot of uh, other AI that's out there that generates uh, images. Google has a has a beta right now that they're working on for that. I believe Pixlr also is able to generate images so I can generate images to match the text that's on my PowerPoint and create an image that is specific to what I want the learner to know. Additionally, I utilize Murph a lot for voice generation. So it's not my voice that I'm recording on the e-learnings. That way, if it ever needs to be updated, maintained, changed, I can put it back into Murph and have the AI generate the voice for me. And it sounds like a human voice instead of that text to speech that comes with a lot of authoring programs. So I can use AI not only for the text, for the pictures, for the voice, hitting all different types of learners. So really from start to finish. Start to finish. Saving that brain power. For the evaluation step, you know, um, we all host our e-learning and different programs and a learning management system that often has that always has that reporting capability, right? So that's the whole point. You're getting that transcript data from the learner. What do you, how do you use AI to help interpret that? Absolutely. So I like to utilize the Kirkpatrick model. Um, and the Kirkpatrick model goes over the four different levels of evaluation, if you will. So level one, the reaction, level two, the learning, level three, the behavior, and level four, the results in there. So when we talk about level one, the reaction is we're evaluating that you know, I'm looking for, did participants find the training favorable, engaging and relevant to their jobs? And oftentimes that's a survey to my participants. And I can utilize that AI to create those survey questions based on what was trained on. I can also use that AI to say, hey, you know, here were the variables that happened during this training. Should I ask other questions on that? So then level two is the learning side of that. And a lot of times, Level two and level three are hard to distinguish between how do I evaluate that. So level two in learning, which is the degree to which the participants acquired the attended knowledge, you know, so in other words, the knowledge, the skills, the attitude, the confidence, the, the commitment based on their participation in this training. A lot of times what I have, what I use to evaluate that is can they repeat it back to me? Is there some way in which they can articulate that they know it, you know? Um, so I'll throw that into ChatGPT. I'll throw that into Google Labs and I'll say, hey, uh, help me find a way to evaluate a their learning and be able to articulate what they may have learned based on these objectives here. And then level three is the behavior. So what I look at for the behavior is usually running reports such as the steps recorder that's found in Windows to identify how long the process originally took versus how long it's taking now. And taking that data, throwing it into the AI and say, giving me a summary of results, you know, what may we have missed in this training that we can do for the next one? There. Or even how can I present these results to uh, my stakeholders? Give me a PowerPoint that's going to talk about the Kirkpatrick model and talk about how I evaluated this training. And then, of course, the results there. 
um, you know, which are the targeted outcomes that we had, the objectives there. How can I, I even will put this into the AI, how can I measure these objectives? under there? What are some of the ways other people have done it? So again, using that AI like another human or a thought partner and through that evaluation method. That truly is end to end right there. Mm, that's for sure. <laughs> through the Addy model. That's, uh, that's awesome. And those were some really great examples for our listeners. We did, sh- we did talk how, you know, it's all about your confidence uh, and competence with using AI. And I, I love those, those two words together because it's so true when you're doing learning and development and your confidence and your competence in a new skill. What lessons have you learned along the way? You know, we're, AI is constantly evolving. What sort of just share more about your lessons and ways that we might be able to save ourselves from the same mistakes as we're, <laughs> as we're taking this journey. <laughs> Absolutely. So everyone's experience is different. Let's preface it with that one. Um, and for me, I was definitely in a space where I was overworked, right? So overworked and that said, a lot of times I'm copying and pasting over and my proofreading was not there. So make sure you proofread. You absolutely have to proofread. You absolutely need to understand your social and and cultural even constraints and limitations and your audience prior to putting anything into your training because AI is so sophisticated now that your learners may not be at that level. So make sure that you meet them where they're at. And the more specific you are with the AI, the more specific it can be to help you get where you need to be. So proofread, proofread, proofread. Also, ask the AI to cite its sources. <laughs> That's a big one. one. That is a good one. For sure. Don't get yourself in trouble with any kind of copyright laws. Don't get yourself in trouble with anything that is someone else's intellectual property that they may have posted on the internet as a preview or a freebie or whatever the case might be that the AI may have picked up. Or AI hallucinations too. (laughs) Exactly that. Exactly that. So make sure you ask the AI to cite its sources from the information that it gives you. So two really good tidbits. (laughs) Those are very good tidbits. When the AI cites the sources, do you go out and personally vet them? Or are you asking AI to double check the citing to see if there's any There's uh, a little bit of restrictions. Yeah. There's definitely a little bit of both. If it doesn't give me a good site for its sources, there's a lot of times that I'll take what the AI has given me, especially if it's chat GPT, and I'll throw it into Google and see what Google gives me to see if it came from specific websites, see if it came from books, text, PDF, .gov sites, whatever the case may be, just so that I can understand where the AI is getting the information. So there's a lot of times I'll take what the AI gave me, pieces, bits of it, all of it, Throw it into Google just to better understand, you know, hey, is it citing correctly? Is it hallucinating the sightings, you know? Um, Or, you know, is there additional work and research that I need to do there to back up the claims that I'm seeing? Or is this even protected information that you need to technically pay for in order to utilize it in the context that you want to utilize it for? Janessa, just thinking of more advice for people getting started, do you think it's best to look for where there's a potential use case and then go find an AI solution or find an AI solution and kind of uh, think about ways in which it might help you with your work? That is a great question. I think that's a a chicken and the egg kind of question, if you will, which they did say that chickens came first. I'll have you know um, (laughs) that it has been proven. Go look it up. Ask the AI. That's your first first task. Go ask the AI and it'll tell you all about it. Anyways, you know, you can do both. Um, it, I think it would depend on your workload. I think it would depend on how much, you know, time you've got on your plate. I think it would depend on, you know, what your comfort level is with AI. I mean, always, always, always connect back anything that you're doing to the organizational business goals and making sure that you are protecting your brain power, your work-life balance. Um, if there are pain points in your Addy model and your SAM model and your agile model, find ways in which you may be able to utilize AI to mitigate some of those pain points. And just circling back to your book for a moment, what are you hoping that people get out of the book? Just to kind of wrap things up with us today, when people are finished, what what do you think the takeaways might be? 
I'm really hoping that they get a really good work-life balance. It's super important to me that they're able to build confidence and competence in utilizing this AI, and they're able to take this information and use the AI um, to its fullest potential and their fullest potential and really empower them to be able to do more to help others. So I'm hoping that they're able to take this book, read the information, better understand AI, feel more confident with it, um, and just be able to help because learning and development departments are running super lean nowadays more than ever. And people are recognizing the need for more training and more learning. Uh, so they're being asked to do more than they ever have been before. So hopefully this will help save their brain power and keep them in the learning and development field for longer. Oh, that's terrific. Well, thank you for helping us to save our brain power today. You gave some terrific responses, and I think uh, you're empowering people listening to go out and learn more about artificial intelligence and, and figure out the best ways that they can put it to work for them in their job. So, Janessa Jacobs, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. It was really helpful to hear you walk through the Addy model with AI. I loved it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye now. Angeline Janessa is really putting AI to the test, and she had some great practical uses. She did. I really enjoyed talking to her and hearing all of the ways she's using AI in her role. You know, we talked about this when we were at TICE this year, but AI as a topic was the main event. And I know we've even done some podcasts on AI, right? So the mm-hmm. halls are always buzzing about the AI sessions, but at the same time, the majority of attendees we spoke to felt nervous about using it and they weren't really sure how to start. I think that's the key is just knowing how to start. But once you do put your toe in the water and start experimenting and listening to people like Janessa sharing some ways that they're using it, all of a sudden it doesn't become scary at all. It becomes a really great tool. Yes, you know, and it was even the case at DaVinci, right? You know, we were, our team was so excited to start integrating AI as soon as, you know, new technology started coming out. How can we put it into our workflow? But there was still hesitancy at first, and it took us a bit to establish our point of view and our use policy, especially, you know, with, with DaVinci being a vendor, we need to ensure we're always setting expectations up front. We're maintaining transparency into our process and above all, always protecting client confidentiality. So for our listeners out there who maybe haven't dipped their toe fully into the water with AI, I say give it a go. Um, You know, as Janessa said, save your brain power and see if you can leverage it to make your time more well spent. Uh, Just be sure to also consider any standard operating procedure when it comes to using AI for your work. No, good advice. I even know with Powered by Learning, I wasn't using AI before. And at first I was a little hesitant because I already had a really good process in place. But now that I'm using AI to help with processing and editing the podcast, it's been a great tool. And I'm, I'm really thankful for the new process and the time back in my day to do other things. Yes, it's incredible how it's been able to streamline that. Thanks, Angeline. And special thanks to our guest, Janessa Jacobs of Second Avenue for sharing her expertise with us. If you have an idea for a topic or a guest, please reach out to us at poweredbylearning at davinci.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Powered by Learning wherever you listen to your podcasts.